Good morning, and welcome to Fridays with Frank, a lecture series sponsored by the Frank Church Institute at Boise State University. My name is Gary Wenske, and I am executive director of the Frank Church Institute in the School of Public Service. The Frank Church Institute was established to honor the achievements and to carry forward the principles of Senator Frank Church. He delivered the first lecture on war or peace, the American role at Boise State University in 1982. Given today's challenges to democracies around the world, conversations like these are even more important. On behalf of the Frank Church Institute Board of Directors, our thanks to Oppenheimer Companies, C. Frederick Cornforth, and Community Development Inc. for underwriting this series on how democracies survive and thrive in the 21st century. Thanks also to AJ and Susie Balukoff for sponsoring today's session. Today's speakers will address the topic, rising inequality and concentration, an additional push from the pandemic. Sylvain Leduc is executive vice president at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Previously, he served as deputy governor of the Bank of Canada and as a senior economist at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington, DC. Joining him this morning is Skip Oppenheimer, chairman and CEO of Oppenheimer Companies and a director of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. He is also the founding chair of Idaho Business for Education and the president of the Frank Church Institute Board of Directors. Welcome to both, both of you. Uh, a reminder to our viewers, if you have questions for our speakers, please click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time during the session. Let's begin with Skip Oppenheimer. Great, thank you very much, Gary. And thanks everybody for being, being here and being part of this. We, we're looking forward to it. And I wanna just give a a particular thanks to Silva for taking the time to be here today, as, as everybody I think knows and everybody's experiencing, frankly, this is about as challenging a time as we've seen in, in generations. That's particularly true at the Fed. And so, so then it's particularly appreciated that you've taken the time to be here today. I've had the real pleasure of getting to know Silva through my experience of being on and serving on the Fed. I spent three years on the Salt Lake City branch uh, board, and we'll give you a little, hopefully a little more insight as to how all these things work, work and work together. And then I've spent a year or more, I guess now on the, on the main office board in San Francisco and gotten to know Silva through those experiences. And I will tell you that Silva is one of the most highly respected economists at the Fed. And, and beyond. Um, and he can, as I think you will see, often make dry and complicated and fairly you know, complex data understandable and interesting and relatable uh, to even people like me and hopefully to all of you, as I think you will all see today. And Sylvan is just a lot of fun to work with as well. You know, on a quick personal note also, I just would say, you know, when I got involved with the Fed, I really didn't know what to expect. I, I knew that, you know, the Fed had a lot to do with interest rates, of course, and monetary policy, but, you know, it was kind of like a dark hole, like what do these people actually do? And uh, one of the things that I've found that has been a, a particularly, and we'll get into more about that, what do these people do and, and what, what the Fed as an institution and its important role in the economy does. But I just wanted to add quickly a, a personal note. I, I must say that the quality of the people who dedicate their careers to the Federal Reserve are some of the really smartest people in their arena that are out there. Um, a lot of them could be making lots of money outside of the Fed, and some do that, uh, and that's fine. But for so many there whom I, I've gotten to know who dedicate their careers to this institution, the dedication they show, the uh, commitment to the work, the acknowledgement, knowledge of 
the importance and impact of what they're doing is is really inspiring. And you know, certainly, uh, what their work does has huge impact. <clears throat> and we'll we'll hear some about that today around some of the issues we're going to be talking about. But you know, from Mary Daly, who's been at the Fed for I think what's so about 25 years, I believe. Uh, following in the shoes of John Williams, by the way, who went on to become the president of the New York Fed and, and in that capacity as a vice chair of the uh, FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, and before that, Janet Yellen was in the position of president of the San Francisco Fed, so it's good company. Uh, Mark Gould, who's the first vice president and COO, has been with the San Francisco Fed for 30 years. Um, Sylvan's been there for, I think, 22, uh, with a couple of years in between as the deputy governor of the Bank of Canada. Uh, and Robin Rockwood, just to give one more example, senior VP for Community Affairs for Public Engagement and the Office of the Secretary has been there over 30 years, and so many others throughout the organization that are truly some of the most impressive people that I, as I mentioned, that I've had the pleasure of working with. And Silva is, is right at the top of that list. Uh, and the Fed is really an important component that fits well with the Frank Church Institute, with our theme of how does democracy survive and thrive in the, into the 21st century. So I think there's a good fit with, with, with this topic today. And also a good fit, I think, with some of the the kinds of values and principles that Frank and Bethine Church stood for over all those many years. So our main topic today is rising income inequality and the trends toward greater concentration of wealth and, and concentration of capital and how the pandemic is accelerating and, and impacting that. And again, I think, uh, again, given our theme at the Frank Church Institute, a timely an important topic. Our line of march is for Savannah to, to give us sort of a presentation to set out some considerations around the topic and then we'll have some questions and conversation between Sylvana and, and myself. And then as Gary said, please send your questions in over the chat uh, and Gary will be able to ask those uh, as we move into that part of the, of the session. And I, I'm hopeful, as I said, that we'll have some time also to talk a little bit about what the Fed does a little more broadly. Um, so Sylvan, thanks again so much for being here and we look forward to your initial remarks and to, to the discussion. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Skip. Thank, thanks for the very kind words and I'm really delighted to be with uh, all of you here today. Um, Skip, I think uh, I'm delighted also to see that you're really enjoying your time with us at the Fed. I wanna say that uh, the information that you bring to the table, that all the directors on our boards bring to the table is really invaluable to uh, policymakers, but people like me also in, in economic research. I mean, as you may expect, we, we look at a throw of a data really. You know, we look at, uh, at, at all the sectors of the economy, at all the regions to see how the national economy is doing. Uh, but often this, the picture that this, that this is painting is really incomplete and that's because we get that data with quite a delay, often a month, often three months, sometimes more than that. And so the picture we get is really incomplete. And the information we get from my directors who come from all walks of life, from businesses, from um, workforce development, from, uh, uh, from nonprofits, uh, they tell us what's happening in real time on the ground in their industries. And that really completes that picture we get from the more formal data. So this is really invaluable. Um, so, so today uh, I want to talk about, I want to paint a picture a little bit of the economy and how uh, we're experiencing growing trends toward greater income inequality and greater industry concentration. And I want to discuss how the pandemic is impacting this and may actually accelerate the trends we're, we're seeing. And you may wonder why talk about this in a forum dedicated to uh, discussing how democracies uh, survive and thrive in the 21st century. Uh, well, I really think that we political outcomes and economic uh, outcomes are often linked much more than we think they are. And, uh, you know, at least in economics, when we, we when our, our mainstream frameworks uh, tend to abstract from the political process to simplify things a little bit. 
but but this is really really important as a matter of fact and one of the book books that i uh recommended on the list uh, why nations fails does exactly that it really embeds the political process with economic outcomes and tries to make sense of, of what's happening in different countries and i think that's a it's a great read if you have time to uh to to go through it of course by now uh think you know saying that uh we're we are polarized uh, societies is is a bit of a cliche uh this is happening here we just went through an election and and clearly our population is, is very divided. This is happening in, around the world uh, uh, as well. It's happening from uh, my home uh, country in, in Canada. It's happening also, if, if you think about the UK and, and Brexit, the same thing is happening there. Uh, what's happening also is that our economies are polarized, and this is maybe a bit less well known. And what I want to do today is, is drive that point. And I'm going to do this uh, by, by with a few slides and hopefully this uh, gives you a, a good visual of, of those trends. And I'm gonna start sharing my, my screen now. So I should state also that these, uh, these are my views and don't represent the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco or the Federal Reserve System at large. Uh, in terms of these, these trends, the first thing to realize is that uh, the share of national income that is going to labor in the form of uh, compensation, wages, and other benefits has really been shrinking over the past 40 years or so. And you can see this here. Uh, you know, it, it, it's been steadily going down. And then since 2000, that, that trends to where a lower share of income going to labor has really accelerated. Uh, another way to say this is that wages haven't kept up with the increase in labor productivity. And, and the flip side of all this is that, so less of national income is going towards to, to labor, but more is, is, is going towards uh, those who are holding capital uh, and those who are uh, holding firms profit. So that's the flip side of that. So more, more is going to capital. And this is actually important to understand uh, income inequality. So this is a chart that I find to be really uh, striking. <clears throat> It shows uh, um, the share of, uh, of national income that's going towards different groups. So if you pay attention to the blue line, it tells you how much is going to the top 1% uh, of the income uh, distribution. And you can see that it roughly doubled uh, between 1980 and, and today, rising from about the 11% to, to something close to 20% today. And the flip side of that is that the share going to the bottom 50% in the income distribution as, as is sort of a mirror image, as declined from about 20% in 1980 to about 12% today. And so these, these are striking, uh, striking trends. So some of it is, is really linked to education, particularly in the 80s and 90s, there's really been this uh, premium for, for highly educated uh, workers. Uh, you know, like the, the, the job description are, necessitate more and more skills, often because it's coupled with understanding new technology. Uh, there's been a growing trend toward that. Um, and so the demand for skill has risen, often uh, outpacing the, the supply uh, of skills. And so, uh, so that has driven a lot of the income inequality in the past. Since 2000, this has also been complemented by, by what I described before, by the fact that uh, a greater share of national income is going towards those who hold capital. And that tends to be those at the top of the income distribution, those who have stocks uh, or derive uh, income from uh, uh, interest accounts and, and dividend payments. Uh, and so like that ownership of stocks, as we know, is very unequally distributed. It goes towards those uh, people at the top of distribution uh, mainly. So the other thing that's interesting to note, and I think it's important to, to to, to know this in terms of what is driving these, uh, this, this trend is to see that this is, this is also happening globally, uh, but it's maybe a bit more pronounced in the United States. So, you know, you look at these different countries here, Germany, France, uh, Sweden, Italy, they all experience a, a growth in the, the share of income earned by the top 1% over, you know, 75 uh, to about today. For the US it's growing, uh, is, is growing more than more than that. And so there are clearly sources for those trends that are particular to each country. So in the US, you could think about 
the fiscal system, uh, you know, taxes, uh, or you could think maybe or maybe maybe race play uh, play some some role. Uh, for but but because it's global, uh, you want to think about global factors, and so technology could be one of them. Automation could be one of them. Globalization also could be one of them. And so, so that's that's important to keep these in mind when you when you try to make sense of those trends and those, and those data. What's also interesting is that when you look at this from, so this is coming from the income side, but if you look at industries, the same thing is sort of happening. So, <clears throat> one thing we can look at is market concentration, the amount of of revenues that are uh, that are um, earned by the top, let's say, twenty firm. If you look at the retail sector, for instance, between you know 1980 to today, you see that the concentration in that industry has really uh, risen quite dramatically from about 30% to, to roughly 50% today. And so, and this is the retail sector, but the same occurs if you look at uh, a different sector, it could be whole, the whole sec wholesale sector, services, manufacturing, you see this trend toward greater concentration. Um, so, so it's really when you look at the data, you really you really see that uh, there's this dichotomy between the, the top firms that are very close to the technological frontier. You could think about the Google, Tesla of the world, and all the other firms that are a little bit behind. And and a lot of that, uh, uh, all, a lot of the profits, the revenue are going to to those top firms, and and so that raises, of course, a whole lot of issues about concentration. What is triggering this? And what are the implications? But but one thing for sure is that the pandemic, uh, I think, is is accentuating some of these trends and maybe continuing, uh, and, and will do so in the future. And I want to walk you through through the, my, my thinking about this. Uh, I think it's important to think uh, to, to, if you want to understand the impact of the pandemic on the on the economy, uh, we have to remember the the, the following uh, facts that we really live in the services economy. So here I'm just uh, reporting the share of service in consumption expenditure and the share of services in, in employment. And I find those to be really striking, maybe well known, but it, I find them uh, like just seeing it in charts to be useful. So, you know, in terms of consumption, we really consume services, you know, 70% of, of, of our consumption expenditure are going towards services. If you think about employment, it's even more striking, more than 80% is, you know, we're working, we're really working in the services sector. And, and that's what's really been different uh, in this current downturn caused by the pandemic. Of course, the source of the downturn was different this time. We've we, we haven't had pandemic uh, uh, driven recessions in the past. And, and so, uh, but uh, the way it played out is also very different. So here I'm plotting two things. The, the, the evolution of, of, uh, of manufacturing or the good producing sector uh, during a recession. So the, the area basically tells you the range of outcomes during previous recession. And the red line is what's happening today. And it plots it compared to, it starts at the peak. So it's index 100. And then it, it looks at how the economy has evolved in those sectors following the peak of the business cycle. So if you look at the goods producing sector, you see that the, the dramatic downturn we've seen uh, is much more pronounced, is much more rapid than we've seen in the past. But typically the you know, goods producing sector does decline in recession. What's more striking is if you look to the, uh, the chart on the, on the right, if you look at, this, at, at services, you see that typically uh, during recession, uh, you know, services hold their, their own pretty well. It doesn't decline that much. That's what's different this time around. If you look at the red line on the right, you see that compared to that, that blue area, services has really collapsed. And that's why it's so important because one, we consume services and two, uh, we work in the services sector. And so when you think about the impact of the pandemic, you see what's happening in employment and that's why it's, so, it's been so big. Uh, at, the, at the height of the, of the impact of the pandemic uh, on the economy back in March and April, we basically lost uh, 20 years of employment gain. I mean, 20 years of employment gain, that's just as striking as this downturn has been. And since then we've we recouped a fair amount as the 
the economy is reopened. But but again, because it hit services, the impact was was so big because well, of course uh, the sector is is high um, a high uh, contact uh, with people with proximity, and so and so uh, you know when the sector was was uh, more hit when people uh, started avoiding going to to retail sectors and and and, and shopping uh, directly with uh, at the shops. Now. The, the services sector also employs a lot of uh, uh, of people with lower skills and a lot of uh, underrepresented underrepresented groups. So and so you see this here, and this is why you think the impact on inequality uh, is coming. So this is the employment evolution since uh, since since uh, just the pre pandemic, and you can see uh, and I'm plotting it for different groups. So those do, who earn thirty dollars an hour or more. 17 an hour uh, or more, be, and, and those that earn less than that. So that's the, the blue line. And you can see that for those who earn relatively more, we're back to where we were pre-pandemic. Okay, so that's, so they're doing now, I mean, they've been hit, not as much as those who, who earn less, but in terms of employment, they're, we're basically back to where, uh, where we were pre-pandemic. So that's the yellow line. If you look at those that earn less, that's quite a different picture. Uh, you see that the hit to, to employment for those groups was much more significant. And you see that what's recovered uh, is just a fraction of where they were pre-pandemic. And so it tells you a lot about uh, how unequal the impact of the pandemic has been on employment across different groups. And this is the same thing in terms of uh, if you look at underrepresented groups in the economy. So if you look at uh, the impact uh, on, on white employment compared to those in, in, for blacks and, uh, and Hispanics, uh, you can tell that the, the impact for these, uh, for blacks and Hispanic has been more pronounced initially and, and now has not recovered as much as, uh, as, as for whites. And so again, this is playing out in the pandemic as a, as a force that, uh, that's really unequal, uh, has an unequal impact on, on different groups and different segments of the economy. Now, now, how do we think about this uh, uh, going forward? I think, as I said, you know, the pandemic is, is already increasing inequality and it's very much likely to, to increase concentration. What we see now is, is demand shifting toward larger firms. Uh, you could think about it as uh, just, you know, we're shopping online, we're using Amazon most of the time, or, or uh, you know, you're going to Walmart and Target. And so there's really a shift from smaller firms that are really hurting right now and, and often uh, you know, going, going bankrupt and closing shops. And, and so we're shifting demand towards larger firms, which would uh, accentuate the, the trend towards greater concentration. There's also the idea of automation now. Um, the, the idea that uh, firms may, may think about the current pandemic, but also about the likelihood that pandemics will be more, uh, will be greater in, in the future and may decide to automate some of those uh, high touch uh, jobs, high touch occupations, uh, those that are often held by, by uh, um, underrepresented groups and those with lower skills. And so again, this would be a trend towards greater inequality. And a point I wanna make at the end is that uh, those, those effects really depends on our policy response. You know, we're not, we're not helpless here uh, it really depends on, on our health uh, policy response and also how we, we respond at the Fed. And I'll discuss that very uh, briefly. But uh, just in terms of automation, one thing that's been striking. Uh, so if you think about recessions, typically investment falls uh, across the board. So you know, I, I'm plotting here a few categories for the evolution of, uh, of investment in, uh, in the second quarter of this year and the third quarter of this year. And, and the point here is that you see that for most categories, we've seen a decline compared to the previous year. The exception is investment in computers and peripheral equipment, and that's the, uh, the pale blue uh, column. And you see that this has actually risen. And, and of course it makes sense. Intuitively, you see companies investing more in this so that uh, hopefully the workforce can telecommute uh, can work from different parts uh, of the country. And, and this is something we haven't seen in, in the past. Typically this, this also falls in recession, uh, but it could also be that firms are thinking about automating some of the jobs that are more 
at risk now, uh, right now of, uh, of being impacted by, by the pandemic. And, and so if you think about this, about automation, uh, you know, automation is really typically skill bias. You, so we have to produce the robots and to do this, uh, you, need, you need a lot of skills and they tend to uh, substitute for uh, low, skill, uh, low skill jobs. And so, it, you know, it may really end up uh, accentuating uh, inequalities. So for instance, you know, for those who hold a college degree, what we know now is that their median net worth is, is above 300,000. If you think about those that uh, hold a, a, high, a high, school, uh, high school diploma, it's much less. The net worth is below 100,000. And those trends toward greater automation would come to accentuate this, this divide. Now, let me just uh, conclude here uh, with, with one slide. I wanna say, I wanna make the point that uh, those trends are not completely independent of, of the policies we take. And I wanna take the example of, of what happened following the Great Recession in 2008 and 2009 and think about uh, the movement in labor force participation. Uh, of course, the population is aging. And so what we see here is that the labor force participation for women and for men has really been on a, down, on a downward trend since 2000. Uh, at the Fed, after the Great Recession, uh, policy has been very accommodative. So, so that means that interest rates have been low for, for the better part of the 10 years following the Great Recession. And at the, at the beginning, people were really wondering, you know, like saying, well, maybe like we're doing, rates are way too low because uh, a lot of the movement of the, in the labor force, people have left the labor force, not only because they're discouraged because they can't find a job, but because you know, they're retiring. People are aging and they're just leaving the labor force. But look at what happened over time. As the economy picked up, picked up spe uh, uh, speed and strength, look at what happened from 2016 to right before the pandemic. You saw the labor force participation rate of women in particular coming back and surpassing where it was uh, during the Great Recession. And the, the same thing for men do to, to a, a lower degree. Uh, but so, you know, if the, if the job market is good and the economy is really booming, and we heard that from our directors, from people like Skip, who were saying, you know, it's, it's, hard, to find, it's hard to find workers. And so what happened is that companies were looking at workers that often they would have uh, uh, overlooked, uh, you know, in previous, uh, uh, previous years. And so you saw that uh, we were able to pull people from, from the sidelines and back back in the labor force. And I think that's, uh, that's the kind of policy we'll have to conduct in the years ahead to make sure that, uh, that people are not left behind from the impact of the pandemic. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and, and maybe skip. So this is, you know, of course, a picture that I'm painting at the national level, but I'm really wondering if, uh, if this resonates with you, if, uh, if you're seeing similar trends uh, in, your, in your own sector, uh, in your own business. Well, thank, thanks, so that. I think that sets the stage very well. The, um, you know, as, as far as our, our businesses, and we're in two businesses, really, two industries. We're in the food manufacturing, food distribution uh, business, and we're also in the commercial real estate business, as you know. And, uh, you know, I would say, you know, both those businesses track very much with exactly what you're saying. Number one, automation. I mean, I think we all recognize if you aren't automating, if you aren't getting more productive, although productivity increases are, at least when you look at the macro data, actually decreasing, uh, at least in our industries, to play the game, to be in the arena, you literally have to be constantly looking at automation re at, at higher levels of productivity. There is, in both of our our business is a tremendous pressure on pricing. Uh, in order to be competitive, therefore you have to become more productive. Uh, in the food industry, we're seeing also, to your point of consolidation, uh, more and more, it, it slowed down during the pandemic, uh, but when you look at the, again, the businesses we're in, if you look in Boise, Idaho, where we're, we're headquartered, you look at Albertson's prime example, merges with Safeway, uh, you know, 15 years ago, they had been broken into kind of bits and pieces. They've been sold to super value. Now they own Safeway. And then if you look at the number of banners under the Albertsons umbrella, it's, it's really significant. Uh, and in a way that's, that was part of what 
I think led to the survival of Albert since Bob Miller, who's sort of an iconic figure, not sort of, is, is an iconic figure around here, literally brought the whole company back and then ultimately acquired Safeway, gained a lot of efficiencies and gained a lot of, I think, higher levels of quality than they'd had in the immediate past. And that allowed them as a company to survive. So there's really two sides to all this, uh, but the automation that's going on in, in retailing, you know, led by Walmart is, is palpable. It's, it's, it's kind of the ticket to enter the business. If you aren't doing that, you're not gonna be competitive. Same way in food processing, Simplot, you know, large privately held company here, uh, as an example, had three different manufacturing plants for, for frozen potato products. They consolidated all three into one plant in Caldwell, Idaho, those three plants, these don't hold me to these numbers, but roughly maybe employed 1,500. I think the plant in Caldwell has something like three or 400, you know, plus or minus. Uh, and again, that's, it's a billion pound plant producing as much as those three. But if you didn't do the automation, you, you probably wouldn't be able to compete and you wouldn't have the three or 400 jobs. So same way with us in our manufacturing side, um, the, we have a plant in Ohio that makes frozen dessert products. Um, that had over 300 people when we acquired it as a Friendly's ice cream plant. It had been shut down, so they were really interested in another owner taking over and trying to build the jobs back. But we have about 100 people in that plant. And again, if we didn't operate efficiently, we wouldn't have the 100. So that's just, I think, very much in keeping with what you're saying. On the food service distribution side, you look at the large players, Cisco, US Food Service, Gordon's, PFG, They've been on a, you know, a lar very fast track towards acquisitions for 25 years. So I think that's all just examples of what you're saying. And uh, I think uh, with the pandemic, it slowed down, but I think that'll continue in the future. Real estate, less so. Real estate seems to be a little more entrepreneurial. Uh, and so I think it's a little more fragmented and doesn't seem to have gone through quite the consolidations. But Bottom line, yeah, I, I agree very much with the, those directions, those trends that you're you're talking about nationally certainly apply to our, our businesses. So that. You know, one idea, maybe before we get into a little deeper discussion, there's some really good questions I've noticed on, on the chat we also want to get to, but I wonder just to set the stage a little bit so we can talk a little bit about what the Fed's role is as we talk about some of the income inequality issues uh, and concentration issues. If you could kind of just give us a brief overview of what kind of is the charge, a little bit about the dual mandate and then beyond as far as the role that the Fed plays. So then. Yeah, because it's often uh, misunderstood. It's the uh, institution that's in the news often, but that it's still a little bit nebulous, uh, I think. Uh, so, I mean, the, the Fed's main mandate is, um, is to, to keep prices uh, stable and to achieve maximum employment. And to do so, we use uh, you know, a short-term interest rate to, to try to uh, manage the economy towards those, uh, those goals. And, and it's really challenging in a sense because we have two goals and only one instrument. Uh, and so it makes, you know, we have to weigh trade-offs because things not, don't always go in the same direction. So if, for instance, if we lower interest rate, it would tend to boost inflation and boost employment. But sometime, you know, we may, we may be in a situation where inflation is too high and employment uh, to too low, and w which would bring trade-offs a bit like we were in the in the seventies, for instance. We're not in this situation right now. Right now, we have inflation that's that's low, and we have, of course, with the pandemic, employment is really low. And so, to to achieve uh, our dual mandate, we we need to keep interest rate uh, low for for a fair amount of time, just to to help uh, businesses and the economy pick up. So that we see inflation at, at where we where we want two percent on average uh, over time, and and have uh, employment that's uh, that's the maximum level uh, that we that, that we can achieve. And and we often think about it as uh, you know maximum employment is everyone who wants a job can can find a job and work uh, the number of hours that they, they choose to to do. So this is in terms of monetary policy. We have other mandates also. We uh, we partly oversee financial stability. Supervise, uh, supervise the banks. Uh, so that's a responsibility that's uh, delegated to, to the federal, uh, the different regional banks uh, across the system. And we also oversee the payment system, which is, uh, 
is something you know we often forget about. We take it for granted that uh, there's transaction going on every day uh, between big banks, uh, and and we we supervise that. So so these are our big uh, big mandates. Uh, but you know, to work at the Fed I'd say is is extremely interesting because of that, and it, it's it's pretty pretty challenging. We have a big group of uh, economists uh, around the system, about 400 uh, economists or so. A lot of them are at the board of governors, uh, but um, you know, it's we we also have 12 regional banks, so that the system is highly decentralized, and and it's a great thing I think because it uh, it sort of avoid groupthink. Uh, you're in different locations. And so uh, people bring different perspectives, the perspective from their own district, but also different perspectives from uh, different strands of, uh, of economics, if you want. Great. You know, just picking up on some of the levers that the, the Fed might have to address some of these issues. I mean, first of all, maybe at a broad level, where do you see fiscal policy, which is outside of the Fed's purview, although there's a lot of connection and coordination and monetary policy. I mean, ultimately, this is all about individuals and sometimes you know, we can get into these rather broad discussions, but ultimately we're talking about people out of work, people making less money, people trying to figure out how to pay the bills in a lot of cases. How do you see the Fed's role relative to monetary policy and the, the levers it's got vis-a-vis -vis the treasury, let's say, and, and, and the executive with fiscal policy. Right, so I think in a, in a downturn like this one, that's so pronounced, I think both policy have to, to move in the same direction. So for instance, the Fed, we were very, uh, very quick to respond back in March. You know, we brought short-term interest rate to essentially zero uh, in, in, a, in a matter of week. And we've introduced, uh, you know, facilities, lending facilities to help uh, markets uh, function better. I mean, we could see in March and April that markets were seizing up a little bit, and and that's important because you know we can lower interest rate, but then if they don't go through, and impact longer term rates like mortgages, uh, because financial markets are not operating normally, uh, then then policy is not as effective, and that's why we intervene in, in financial markets to help a smooth functioning. Uh, but you know we're we're at zero now, uh, so you know we can't lower the federal funds rate uh, much below zero. Uh, we've said we would not go negative. Uh, basically, other countries have have gone negative uh, in Europe and, and Japan. But there's so much you you know you, you cannot go that 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 much negative before people take their money out of the banking system and just keep it under under their pillows. Um, you know we can do other things at the Fed. We 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 can. Uh, purchase uh, assets, uh, treasury bills and uh, uh, agency bonds like Fannie Mae and Fannie Mac, Freddie Mac uh, to help lower long-term long interest rates. And so you've, you've heard about QE uh, that we've used uh, following the Great Recession, but, but now uh, to some extent uh, again, and we can help guide market about what, uh, what the future may hold in terms of, uh, of policy without making promises but just basically saying, you know, we intend to keep rates uh, at a low at a low level to make sure that we we get the pandemic uh, behind us, and that helps keep rates low. But you know, given the size of the downturn, fiscal policy has a big role to play, and I think uh, Fed policymakers have been very vocal about this. Uh, one one uh, important aspect of fiscal policy is that it can be better targeted. So if you think about monetary policy, we're moving one interest rate. And, the, and that one interest rate impacts, you know, all sectors somewhat equally and, 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 and everyone. Like, so you can be targeted with, the, with that rate. Uh, and that's what's great with fiscal policy, it can be targeted. You know, so you can, you can target uh, households that are more at risk during the pandemic, those that are suffering more, extend unemployment benefit, uh, target uh, small businesses through uh, the, the, the PPP uh, program. Uh, and so, so those are, are really important uh, because of that, because it's more targeted. Uh, and, and I think that the two policies together can, can, can be much more powerful than if we go uh, at it alone or fiscal policy uh, does it alone. I think now the two pushing uh, towards uh, the same goal is really important. Sylvan, so we have some questions I'd like to uh, pose if that's okay. Um, you, of course. Can I, can I just finish one more quick question and then, and then I'll turn it over? 
And I think, you know, if it's okay with everybody, we did build, build a little buffer in so we can go maybe 10, 15 minutes over. Uh, but there is one question that I've had people ask me to, to ask you, I think. <laughs> I don't want to not, not do it. And there's others that Gary will get to the same way about education and other things. But, you know, there is a lot in the press about the role of politics with the Fed. And, you know, how political is it? And, and how much pressure is there from, you know, from the executive and so on? And I, I would just say on my personal experience, literally in every board meeting I've ever been in since I started, there's never been one, really one discussion. It's tied, as you talked about, to the dual mandate, to what's best for the economy. Never heard anything about what the stock market's gonna do or what the, the executive branch is saying in terms of the kind of idea of political pressure. But I'd just like to get your, your take on that because I think it's on people's minds and then Gary, we'll, we'll turn it over to you right after that. But I uh, wanted to get, at least get that piece into the, the mix so that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's an important question. Uh, basically, the politics never enters the discussion. I know it may be surprising to people, but it, it simply doesn't. Uh, we're, not, we're not thinking about the political process. We're not thinking about political pressure. What we, what we think about is the, the, the policies that are being implemented by, by the political process. So that, that we take into account. We, we have to because uh, the policies that are implemented in terms of taxes or government spending really impact the economy. And we have to think about that to calibrate monetary policy at the appropriate level. Uh, to achieve, you know, again, the dual mandate of price stability and maximum employment. So, so that we take into account, but we're not, you know, we're in an independent institution. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not taking uh, money from, uh, from tech, we're self-finance in, in a sense. Uh, we're not taking uh, money from, uh, from Congress. Uh, and the chair is appointed, the chair of the Federal Reserve is appointed for five years. Uh, cannot be fired apart from being fired for cause. Um, but so it, it gives a, a lot of leeway to the Federal Reserve to achieve uh, its goals without uh, reacting to political pressure. And, and I think that's, uh, that's a good thing. It doesn't mean the Fed is not accountable. It, it means the Fed, the Fed, you know, the chair goes to, uh, to Congress to testify on monetary policy. And so the Fed is accountable to, uh, uh, to, to, to policymakers uh, in Congress. Uh, but it has leeway to, to conduct monetary policy away from political pressure. And I think that's, uh, that's really important. Yeah, good point. Gary, let me, let me turn it over to you. CNN is reporting yesterday that the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Mr. Powell, said that the economy as we know it might be over. It's probably a thing of the past. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, you've touched on this this morning. Yeah, I think I think it's basically like the the big changes we uh, we may see, uh, you know. And I think it's it, it, uh, what will be challenging for us at the Fed is is understanding what's going to be permanent, what's going to be structural, become a structural fact, or or what's going to be cyclical. That's always the the, the main issue. Uh, we'll see people, for instance, leaving. I mean, we're seeing this now. We see people living, uh, leaving big cities and maybe going towards smaller ones. Boise, Idaho has been a, a recipient of, uh, of influx of, of population. So what does that mean uh, going forward? Uh, we'll see, I think, potentially greater trends towards automation. And again, what does that mean for uh, our low income workers that may be more at risk of being automated? Uh, you know, some studies uh, that have been done uh, basically show that there's maybe about 10% to 30% of occupations that are at risk of automation in those that are in high touch uh, sectors. So, you know, that's not uh, negligible. And, um, and so that has implications for, for employment. And some of it is may, may be permanent, but some of it, again, will be reacting to the type of policies we we put in place and how monetary policy reacts and how fiscal policy reacts. The more we can, and, and the quicker we can put this behind us and bring people back to work, the less uh, so-called scarring effect there will be. Because of course, if people are on the sideline for a long time, their, their skills de uh, depreciate, and then it becomes more difficult for them to, to find employment again. So, you know, so I think the policy reaction has to be forceful. Uh, 
uh, we have to, um, to try to put the pandemic um, behind us as fast as possible. And of course, we're not fully in control here. We've said it uh, often in, in the past that the, that the evolution of the virus really is gonna dictate how much progress we make uh, in, in terms of the economy. Uh, and and you know, that's, we're not fully in control of that. It'll depend on how uh, health uh, measures are implemented. It'll depend on how people react to those. You know, do you wear a mask or not? And uh, you know, it, so, so that's outside our control, but we have to take the evolution of the pandemic as given and try to uh, implement the best policies to, to make sure that people can, um, you know, can, can have a bridge between where we were pre-pandemic and hopefully what's gonna be after. Thank you. We have another question here. What is the Fed doing to bend the curve on financial illiteracy in the US? Yeah, uh, so that's really important because it, it gets into, uh, into education. And so, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve uh, banks and the Board of Governors have, uh, have um, groups that are dedicated to, uh, to improving uh, economic and financial literacy. And so uh, some, some of the, so we, we have groups here in, in San Francisco where, uh, you know, we would go outside and meet uh, with teachers and try to, uh, to tell them first what the Fed is doing, but also how the economy is, is, is evolving and try to provide resources uh, to them uh, so that they can teach economics uh, maybe, maybe in a more fruitful manner and that they can reach, uh, um, you know, students in a more, uh, more interesting manner. Uh, some of the regional banks, the Atlanta Fed, for instance, has a big program as as design curriculum for for all the different years uh, of schooling. So you know, if you want to think about how, how should I be teaching a, a third grader, a, a fifth grader, etc., uh, you can go to the Atlanta website and they they have a curriculum designed expressly for that. And so and so I find that that's that's extremely important because economics is is not an easy. Uh, not an easy field, uh, you know, uh, we don't teach it very well. I think uh, overall, uh, there's, there's, there's little of it being taught. And so, uh, and so, and then it becomes difficult to understand the impact of, uh, of monetary policy, fiscal policy and, and, and all the ramifications they have. And so I think, I think that's a great question. And, and, uh, and the Federal Reserve, I wanna reemphasize is very much present as a group in this, uh, in this area. Hey, Gary, to that, to that question, just quickly, too, that relates to us here in Idaho, just as an example of what Sylvan's talking about, you know, Mary Daly, when she became president, <clears throat> kind of continued some of the thoughts, I think, of John, but even accelerated. How does the Fed take all of these incredible resources and impact around the dual mandate more directly, you know, the people that, that live in the, in the district, in, in the nine states? And one of the examples, we're doing a pilot in Idaho around education that is slowed down a little because of the pandemic, but it's starting in Idaho Falls and Nampa is the current plan to, to get information through the Idaho Business for Education group, working with Rod Grammer and, and also Park Price in Idaho Falls to see if there's information that can be disseminated through employers more effectively around key educational issues to their associates or employees around things like how do we get more kids to go on, which we all know is a key piece of the puzzle if we're gonna address particularly this issue of income inequality. So that's just a tangible example too of, of what Sylvan's talking about, it, of the kinds of things the Fed's trying to do to, to impact some of the economic issues around the, this region. Thank you. Uh, several questions regarding climate change and how it's impacting uh, wealth disparity both in the U.S. and around the world. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. This is something we, uh, we have re very much at heart in, uh, in San Francisco. And it's growing, uh, this, you know, a, a growing uh, uh, interest throughout the Federal Reserve System. But for instance, the San Francisco Fed uh, a year and a half ago put up the, the first conference on climate uh, at the Fed. And so we had a big event. Uh, uh, where many people attended, uh, you know, was public. Uh, this is one, of, I think it may be one of the best uh, attended uh, conference that, that we held. Uh, you know, it's really important for us along many dimensions. Of course, it, it, it impacts the economy. 
in a, it affects regions. You know, we see it with the wildfires in California and, and along the West Coast, for, for instance. So we have to understand it, its impact to have a better sense of, uh, of, of what the economy is doing and the risks that are associated with it in the future. You know, th this is at the macro level, but it also impacts financial stability, for instance. Uh, banks are exposed to commercial and, and residential real estate. Uh, those are exposed to uh, the risk of, of climate, uh, be it from wildfires or greater risk of floods. And so what we can see is maybe repricing of assets. So, you know, climate change hasn't been uh, on, on the, the radar screen for most investors for, for a bit. It's, it's changing now. But we could see repricing of assets and that would come to impact uh, banks, balance sheets and other financial institutions. And so it, that has an impact on financial stability, which we oversee. And it also has a ramification for the payment system. You know, so when areas are impacted by, by a climate event, we have to make sure at the Fed that they have, uh, you know, that ATMs are, are, are stashed with enough uh, currency so that people can make, uh, can make transactions. And so all of these, you know, they seem mundane a little bit, uh, more, some more than others, but are really important for the Fed and for, uh, for how we manage, uh, we help manage the economy. And so I think this is something, you know, I think we see the impact of climate more and more, at least in, the, in several regions uh, of the US, that poses a risk. And that's something that the Fed's gonna have to pay uh, more and more attention to in the years ahead. Thank you. And several questions relating to artificial intelligence and how it will threaten low wage workers and how you craft policies to respond to this. Right. So this is, a, I mean, this is, a, of course, a, a concern uh, for, for most people, uh, for us, for policymakers and for us at the Fed also. I think one thing to remember is that these wave of automation are, are not new in a sense. We've seen this. Uh, throughout history, some job disappearing, new ones being created. And I think uh, uh, we've always been afraid of, uh, of the concept of technological unemployment, that, that technology would take over and we would see uh, fewer and fewer people employed. The fact of the matter is, is we haven't seen that. Uh, you know, we've seen people being able to find new jobs in new occupations that were created. So if you think about automation and what we see now, of course, uh, Robots are being created. Some people have to work on those robots and, and help create them, but it does substitute for, for, for some occupations. The, the, the problem here is that there's always transitions. And so some people that, are, that have maybe lower skill now that they're, uh, are, are working in occupations that are more routine based, be it cognitive or, or manual, those are way more at risk of being automated. Uh, and the idea is to help them transition towards these other occupations that are being created by, by the new technologies. And, and this brings up uh, education front and central. And I think what I mentioned that these waves of automation are not new, but what I think is new with the current one, it's the pace of technological change. You know, we've never seen this in the past where, you know, new technology are, are, are basically introduced at a, an exponential rate. So what does it mean now to adapt to, to, such, to such a pace? Uh, you know, I think our education system is not really well designed for this. You know, we, we go, we, we get, I don't know, four years uh, for a degree, uh, and, then, and, then it, and then it's over. And then, <laughs> and then we, we try to cope with the, change, the changing environment that, that technology brings about. Uh, I think we have to emphasize training throughout our lifetime much more. I mean, the federal government invests way less in training than it does uh, in general education, for instance. Uh, and, and, and this is really a tricky issue because who should bear the brunt of this? Like who should do the investment? You know, some of it should be the individual, maybe the companies, but the companies, you know, if you're thinking now that uh, the job of the futures where the robots will be less able to substitute uh, will be like jobs that where you need critical thinking where you need uh, maybe management skills, maybe uh, people skills, if you work, for instance, in the medical care cent uh, uh, sector. So those are, are more general skills that maybe companies don't wanna invest so much in because they're portable. So employers could leave that company and go somewhere else. So maybe there's a role for, for more uh, government help 
to make sure that people can retrain because there's a huge cost also in terms of uh, for, for society to have people lose their skills and then stick on the sideline you know we we need everyone who can work uh, giving that um, i guess our, our our trend growth rate right now is, is much lower than it used to be so the more people we can bring in the, the labor force uh, the better Thank you. Uh, another question, how does growing income and job inequality put stress on and challenges uh, to our democracy? Yeah, so that's the, you know, that's the elephant in the room, really. Uh, and and that, I think that's why the topic is relevant for this forum. Uh, and and, and I'll, I'll touch back to what I started from at the beginning. You know, political outcomes are not uh, de-linked from e economic uh, outcomes. And I think the rise in, uh, in populism, the rise maybe in, uh, towards a more authoritarian trend in, in several countries is partly linked to our growing inequality. Clearly growth hasn't been impacting, uh, hasn't been beneficial to the same extent for, for every group. And so we've heard that in the past, many feel left behind. Uh, and maybe maybe more prone to simple uh, explanations, simple cure uh, that are e maybe easy to implement, but um, it's not clear that, uh, that 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 they'll be successful. But clearly, I think I think that's the uh, that's one danger. That's that's one danger. That that's what we have to to think about uh, carefully. Often we, you know, to be honest, uh, from an economist perspective, economists tend to think about the economy. And again, I was saying. You know, like we, we don't quite introduce political system for the most part in, in most uh, uh, macro framework, but, uh, but that's, I think, something that people are still concerned about. Thank you. Uh, Skip, do you have some more questions for our guest? Here's a question that just came in. Uh, what is the purpose of the 12 regional banks versus the central Fed? So, so that's a good question again. And I touched a little bit on it at the beginning. I think uh, when the Federal Reserve Bank was set up in 1914, there was really, a, a, you know, I mean, the, the idea is really to decentralize power. Uh, and so it was distributed uh, across those, those 12 uh, regional banks. Uh, the way it, it works is that um, uh, so there's 19 members on the FOMC there's uh, on the on, on the that participate in F F FOMC meetings where interest rates are decided, but only a, a, a subgroup of those 19 members are voting on policy at every given point in time. So so the board of governors, the seven governors, they always vote. The uh, the New York Fed always vote, and these other regional banks vote with a rotation. Uh, but part of the system is really to bring facts on the ground, like perspective from the districts. And as I mentioned, I think one benefit of the system is that because you're in different location, there are different cultures in these different departments and they, uh, and they bring different perspective to bear on the policy process. And I think that's really, really important. I think there's less, uh, maybe the system is less prone to groupthink than, uh, than when it's completely centralized. Hey, Sylvan, let me let me pick up on a on a point that um, you've touched on, but kind of bringing this down to how does this affect you know individuals and what when you look at rising income inequality and concentration um, and consolidation. So if I'm somebody you know working in a plant somewhere as you say, a lot of this is retraining to make sure I'm staying current. But is there, I guess, two, two part question. One, what, when you cut through it all, and this ties to our theme suggested about future democracy related in, in a broad brush way without overstating it, I think, you know, what, what, what's the real concern with income inequality? And what advice, if any, this is kind of a big question, but would you give somebody who's in the economy, there's a question up about this, uh, in terms of either historically disadvantaged groups or just people that are trying to navigate daily decisions to safeguard their finances, uh, try to create a higher level of job security, 
kind of what ability does the average person have or just any person have to kind of develop a little more secure future for them and their fam them and their families? Yes, that's a, um, I think that's, the, that's a really difficult question because, you know, like the, my answer would be, <clears throat> you need to, uh, you need to acquire maybe general skills so that you're, you're less prone to be, uh, to be at risk of, of, of automated, of being automated. You can, you, you're more, your, your skills are more transferable from one company to the next, but that's easier said than done. You, you need time to do this. And that's one of the problems, uh, you know, Many of the uh, of, of these of the people that have uh, that are in lower paying jobs that are maybe more at risk, you know, have two jobs often. Maybe they're single parents, and now you're asking them to go and and get greater education, maybe or greater training. You know, it's it's a challenge to do this. It's it's really uh, I'm not sure how you find the time to to do all that. You know, I think companies have kind of a responsibility to to maybe provide. Uh, training to keep those employees and, and, and help develop their skills. Uh, of course, you know, companies see this as s some of those jobs are volatile, uh, people come and go, uh, and they, they may be reluctant to invest in them. But I think there's, there's some responsibility to this. And, and for us at the Fed, I think the best way to achieve this is if we have a strong economy. Because, you know, the past three years, right before the pandemic, we saw way more companies being uh, interested in training because it was seen as part of the package. You know, the, the job market was hot. Uh, you could raise wages, but another way to compensate workers was to provide greater skills development, you know, and, and companies were, were training more because it was difficult to find workers. So you, you, you put more, more resources into making sure you could develop them and they would stay with you. So I think, you know, for, for us having a strong economy uh, it's sort of a, a necessary condition, so to speak. It, it will really facilitate all those adjustments if, uh, if we have a strong economy than if we're in a downturn. Yeah, got it. And maybe, Gary, do you, if you don't have other questions, I might just wrap up with one other. Do you have some other questions you'd like to throw? No, that's, that's fine. I think we've answered most of them. Okay. I guess one last question. You know, we talk, and, and this ties also to the Frank Church Institute, and Frank, of course, with his work as chair of the Foreign Relations Committee and interest in, in foreign affairs and foreign rela international relations. Maybe give us just a little bit of a view going back out more broadly about kind of how the US Central Bank, the Fed, sort of compares with the central banks in other parts of the world. Kind of what's the differences? What are similarities? How much do we work together with those because of, of everything we know about globalization, et cetera? Well, one part that's different is really this, this decentralized system. Uh, many central bank in smaller countries, so for instance, Canada, the, the system is much more centralized to, to start with. Maybe the ECB now, because it's, uh, uh, it's bringing policymakers for, from different countries, is, uh, is akin to the Federal Reserve system to some extent. Uh, in terms of cooperation, I mean, of course, the, the, all the different countries, the U.S., you know, have internal goals. I mean, the, the, the goals is really to try to maximize employment at home and have price stability. So there's no international goals if, if you want, and, and, and that's fine. That doesn't mean that there's no, no cooperation at the, at the international level. There's all sorts of forum where central bankers meet. Uh, you know, there's a financial stability board. Uh, you know, that was set up after the financial crisis to make sure that uh, that central bankers talk and, 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 and share views about what's happening uh, in their own economies. Because, you know, we're all interlinked now. We're linked in finance and we link through trade m much more so than we were in the past. And so problems that uh, emerge in one country, you know, spread around, around the globe clearly. And so uh, having cooperation in the sense of uh, discussions I think it's really, really important. And, and there's a lot of that. So, uh, you know, I think it's important because at times of crises, uh, you need policymakers to, to, to know one another so that they can, they can implement policies that are, that, are, that are better suited for the situation, I would say. And some of the problems we're facing, I mean, think about the pandemic. The pandemic is impacting all those countries. And if you think about climate change, that's the same thing. Uh, everyone is involved, and, and so it, I think, to me, it, it really means a, uh, 
a global approach to, to some of those problems. And so you want to have forums where, uh, where there's possibility to discuss those, uh, those issues at, at the world level. Great. So then thank you so much, Gary. If, if there's no other um, questions on your end, maybe we'll, we run a little over and we did build a little cushion in, but maybe we'll go ahead and, and wrap this up. But, you know, it's always, it's always a, a challenge, I think, to have interactive discussion given the Zoom world we live in. But I think uh, so I did a great job of, of getting a lot of really interesting points out on the table for all of us. And uh, again, we really appreciate your joining us and uh, and really appreciate the job you do and, and all of your associates. So thanks so much. And Gary, I'll turn it over to you just for any last words. Thank you very much. And our thanks to Sylvain Leduc and Skip Oppenheimer for their presentations. Uh, note that the 37th Annual Frank Church Conference will be held Friday, next Friday, November 20th, with keynote speaker and author Larry Diamond. Also two panels on democracy. Professor Diamond will also be interviewed by Bob Kestra on Reader's Corner, airing on Boise State Public Radio today, November 13th, and on November 15th. Also, if you appreciate these sessions, please go to the Frank Church Institute website and contribute. Thank you and good day. <laughs>